see everyone here this morning on a beautiful Sunday, Saturday morning. A little rainy out, but but the flowers love this rain, and we're all here to have gardeners, uh, gardeners in 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 your heart here here at the library because we're going to grow a lot of really wonderful programs this summer, and um, we're excited to have Jill here. But I just want to make a couple of announcements here at the library. I want to thank the friends of the library first and foremost for supporting all these amazing programs and being our advocate and our champion and making all these things happen for us and in our community. And also, I wanted to thank them um, especially for the recent gift for funding a wireless printing service here at the library. So now you can print from your devices, your iPads, your laptops, without mm -hmm. having to go to the computer lab. And you can do that from your home and pick up your printers, printing here at the library. Um, so we're really excited to have that service now. I wanted to draw your attention to some really great events we're having in the next couple weeks. And first off, we're having Carrie Spencer from the Seven Ponds Nature Center. She's going to have a wonderful program called Eating Your Yard. And she's going to explore the wild edibles that you can harvest in your backyard. Um, the other thing I wanted to let you know that we're also having a sunflower contest this summer. And starting May 1st, you can pick up your seeds at the reference desk, grow your sunflower, and come back on September 9th with your stock. And we're gonna have two really amazing prizes that day for the largest sunflower grown. And um, so without further ado, I wanna re recognize and present our wonderful presenter today. Her name is Jill Brzezinski. And she is the owner of Buds and Blooms Gardening, which was created in 2004. Prior to working as a professional gardening service, she gained knowledge at Telly's Greenhouse in Troy and Wojo's in Ortonville, while working toward her college degree in landscape horticulture. Outside of work, she enjoys outdoor activities in the snow and water sports in the summer, and she's a newbie, newbie at beekeeping. That was newbie. Newbie. <laughs> <laughs> and you can tell she's passionate about the environment and doing what she can to maintain a green lifestyle. So without further ado, please welcome Jill Brzezinski. Well, thank you, this is wonderful. I've, um, I've got some handouts, everybody has them, and if I've missed anyone, please let me know, because I've got lots left over. Um, so we're gonna be talking about um, butterflies and hummingbirds, and I've got a lot of plant choices for you, and I'm gonna talk about the plants that um, are on the pitch uh, on the screen here and how they will best suit your yard. So it's a lot of pictures and a lot of information. Feel free to jump in with any questions about what's in your yard and oh I like this but do you think it would go here? Because that makes it more fun but there's more questions. Okay, So don't be afraid to, to hop in there. So we're going to start off with perennials and butterflies and I kind of put them in somewhat um, alphabetical order, kind of by their, their botanical name or what they're most commonly known for, because sometimes they're the same. So this is Agastache. It was the um, perennial plant, I believe, of um, 2022. And this plant is wonderful. And it's named Anise because it truly does smell like black licorice. Um, it is a magnet and some things they, they say that they, they really do attract the butterflies and the bees, but this one, um, being working in the yard, I have to really choose my time of when I come to this plant because it really does attract everything. The bees, the butterflies, not so much the hummingbirds, but um, you know, you're gonna want to service this plant. If you're gonna deadhead it or use it for a cut flower or anything, you're gonna do that early in the spring or on a cool evening just because of all the, the birds and the bees, or I'm sorry, bees and the butterflies. Um, it likes full sun and well-drained soil, and um, not much attention. Uh, it, it does require a little bit of staking, but I have found that if you let plants be natural and fall over, wherever there is a stem, you're going to get a flower. So if, if your plant normally stands up straight like this, and we don't stake it, we don't put a tomato cage on it or anything, and it falls over, you've got several leaves you know, that come up before you get your flower up here. If this falls over, you're going to get a branch that's going to come out of every one of those leaves. So don't be afraid to not be a tidy gardener. We all like everything just the way we like them, but if, if they just kind of flop and do their thing, you're going to get more flowers that way. So there's my tip of the day. Um, this is a different variety, Blue Fortune. 
Um, it's a little more, um, I think, periwinkle blue and um, not as tall. There, the last one was <clears throat> about three feet tall. This is more in the, the 24 to 30 inches. So you've got a little bit of a, a variety so you know whether to put it in the middle of your garden or in the back. Asters, we all know these for um, the fall. And um, the butterflies just, just really gravitate toward them when you think that they're not around because they do need um, a food source, their nectar, in order to give them a lot of energy to get um, to where they need to be in the wintertime for safe, safe harbor. Um, they come in pinks and purples, um, lavenders, and they like full sun, and this plant will creep along the ground. So it's not going to, to stay in one spot. It's good, the, the crown is going to get bigger and bigger. It's more of a, a wandering plant. But it, um, it's very similar. You have to, when you're shopping for these in the fall, be very cautious to read the tag because you're buying this cute little compact plant and you put it in the garden and it's gonna be 24 inches tall next year. So it will survive the winter, which a lot of things that when you buy them for holidays don't really make it through the garden um, through the winter. This one will, just keep an eye on the size so you know where to plant it. <clears throat> this is um, milkweed, also known as Asclepius. I put tuberosa in there because that's its scientific name, and it's very different from the other milkweeds that are out there. This is um, a perennial and um, it gets the, the orange flowers, which bring the butterflies in, but this plant is very important because the monarch butterfly also lays their eggs on the leaves of this plant. On the underside of the leaves, you see um, little white specks, and those are the eggs of the plant. So the trick with this plant is, is you're gonna wanna put it in a place where you're not going to mind seeing any leaf damage because those leg, eggs, when they emerge, they're going to start eating the leaves and you're going to go, oh no, what's wrong with my plant? You know, I've got insects, they're eating it all over the place, but that is normal with this plant. Um, yes? Quick question. Uh, I know there are tropical and native mm -hmm. milkweeds. Is this a native? To this is a native, okay. yes. So when you're looking on the side of the road and driving down freeways and you see a lot of orange spots, um, I would have to say, probably July, July into August, this is what you're looking at. And um, it doesn't need any care. And it does kind of emerge a little bit late, so you might want to mark it so that you know where it is and you don't plant something else in its place or weed it out because it doesn't look like anything. Um, but that's what it is. And it's, it's in the same family of the pink one that you see um, also growing on the sides of the roads or mistakenly in people's yards. Um, this is a clump form, so it's always going to stay in one spot. You don't have to worry about it wandering. The, um, the ones that have the broader leaves and the pink flowers, oh boy, they're wonderful for pollinating, but they get out of hand. And once you have them, you really have to stay on top of them to, to keep them out of your yard. Um, this would be that one that I said, um, well, no, this is a perennial also. It's just a different variety. It, this is much taller. The, um, the orange one here is only about 24 inches tall, whereas this pink one here gets three to four feet tall. So you definitely want to put that in the back of the yard. And there's also another white one called uh, Cinderella, but uh, I haven't had as good of luck with that. And as you can tell, I'm kind of a pink person. <laughs> <laughs> so they both like the sun. They both can um, prefer dry to well-drained soil. And um, this one goes to the back of the garden, whereas the other one more toward the front slash middle of the garden. <clears throat> now, I mentioned this briefly. This is um, <coughs> something that you're gonna wanna have in your garden for a food source. It's nice that they can come around and sip the nectar, but they also need to have a place to, to eat and lay their eggs. And what I have here is, um, this is the monarch butterfly and um, for the milkweed. And you can see that bigger picture in the bottom corner that they really do, when, once they get going, they really get going and they can defoliate your plant. So it's nice to have um, 
a good healthy plant that has lots of leaves on it. And while I'm at that, I'll just jump to the other one. This is the swallowtail, and they like dill and parsley. So if you have that in your garden, before you harvest it, give it a good wash to make sure that you're not eating anybody. And um, <clears throat> keep those in, in great supply so that they have lots to eat. Because those swallowtails, there's lots of varieties of them, but they're just so beautiful. <clears throat> This one is Erebus, also known as rock cress, and this is a low creeping plant. Much like the um, phlox that you see that'll be blooming here pretty soon, and the pinks and the purples and the whites, everybody likes that for a nice green ground cover that has um, spring flowers. This is your same one, but this one likes it hot and dry. So um, you don't need to worry about irrigation so much throughout the year. Definitely um, in the beginning when you first plant it, you're gonna to wanna to give it a lot of attention just to make sure that it gets established, but um, you can let it go. It doesn't mind the heat. Full sun. This one is candy top, and this pink one is very popular. I'm sorry, the white one is very popular. The pink one is new out there, but um, still quite beautiful. It also likes full sun, and um, here you go. Um, well-drained soil, it also stays really low, so um, I would say maybe eight inches sounds about right for this plant, so keep that to the front of your garden. But keep in mind, with these all being perennials, once they do their thing, they're, they're going to be in color and then they're going to be green. So you're going to want to plant some companion plants around them or annuals just so that you have color in that same spot because once this is done blooming, this is a spring bloomer, once it's done, then you have green for the rest of the year in this location. Excuse me. Yes. Um, can you also let us know which ones spread yes. fast yeah. and which ones stay together? For sure. The, um, the candy tuft and the rock crest, these are both ground covered type of plants. They're not fast growers, but they're not slow either. But they're, they are going to wander out of that pot size and kind of keep wandering just because they are ground covers. They're, they're meant to take up some space and hopefully crowd out those weeds. <clears throat> False indigo is one of my favorites and I only have a picture of a blue one here, but they come in a pink and a yellow and a bicolor that I think is called pink lemonade. They all get uh, about three to four feet tall and this plant does not like to be moved. So once you find a place for it, plan on keeping it there for a while. Um, the butterflies do love this. The leaf is gorgeous. It's um, like a five petaled leaf. This is perfect for cut flowers and you can use that leaf kind of as if you would a fern, just a little accents to have a little bit of greenery in your vase. Um, I like to pair this with peonies, FYI, because they both are blooming at the same time. <laughs> Jill? Yep. Is this more sun -shaped? This is a sun plant, yep. Yep. <clears throat> butterfly bush. They have come a long way with the butterfly bushes. They've got a lot of short ones now, I think, are in the pugster variety. <coughs> and then the old-fashioned ones that can get um, six to eight feet tall. And um, it is my experience that um, the old-fashioned purple smells the best and really attracts the most butterflies. Um, that's just my experience. I, I see a lot of them and there's butterflies on all of them, but if you really want the one that attracts them, kind of stick with that old fashioned tall, dark purple one. And the name is escaping me right now. If anybody knows that, I'll be happy to share. Can you think of that? Miss Molly. What is it? Miss Molly? Nope, that's a new one. That's only been out a couple of years. Um, and that's like a fuchsia color. I love that. That's that's new to my garden. <laughs> Once again, the pink. <laughs> cat mint. Now, this is the old fashioned cat mint to Walker's Low, but they've come out with a bunch of new varieties and they've all gone along the cat variety. One's um, Persian Blue and um, Cat's Meow. And I love this plant. This used to be neglected and nobody wanted it because it 
it got tall and it fell open and you had this beautiful color but it wasn't a tidy plant and so you can trim it mid-season and keep it tidy or you can go with those new varieties that have a more vibrant blue that stay small stay compact but this one likes the sun walker's low like i said is the older variety and gets probably 30 inches tall out of all the new varieties i do plant the new ones in other people's gardens just because they like the compactness and i like to do what people like but in my own garden i have this one and I will not lie to you when I say I take the electric shears to it. Mm -hmm. And I just, it, it, it rebounds really well. Mm -hmm. And the butterflies love it and the bees love it. And um, it's really nice and it's made it through all the winters. Um, this last winter wasn't a bad one, but the prior winter um, was pretty mild, but then we got hit with a lot of um, <coughs> cold after we thought it was warm. And it, it really did, it did the catmint and the lavender in. It kind of doomed them for a while. But this one has, has stuck by and, and come through pretty well. Is it really invasive? It is not. Oh, I have oh. not found, it is not tidy. It's, but, but it is not invasive. Tidy. It stays in its place, space. You know, it'll get tall and it'll fall open. So it, it does take up more space than you think. But as soon as you trim that up, you're gonna get a second set of blooms on it, and it's gonna um, stay stay compact then. Yes? Sun or shade? Sun, it likes the sun. It can take part, part sun, part shade, but when I say that, you probably wanna put it in six hours of sun. That's what your, your part sun division is. So the afternoon sun is hotter than the morning sun. So if you don't have as much, if you put it in the afternoon sunny spot, you can probably get away with three or four hours. But the more sun you give it, the happier plant you'll have. Can they be divided, the new variety? I don't see why not. Yeah, because it's, it's a clump. It's not like a wooden stem, like a butterfly bush or a lavender. Those you can't divide. This, yep, just stab a shovel right through the middle. Tixie coreopsis. There's lots of coreopsis out there. Um, this variety is the Tixie, and the butterflies like it as well as the thread leaf. The thread leaf, it's got real fine leaves, but these ones has a nice mass at the bottom, and then these tall stems. It gets probably 18 inches tall. This also likes the sun. Um, <clears throat> and these ray flowers, uh, that's what you call with the, um, the daisy type. They, um, they like that because they can get to it better, the, um, their little antlers. Full sun. Um, this can take a more sandy soil, um, but still well drained. I wouldn't, wouldn't stick it out uh, in a dry, rocky spot. But um, if you gave it some attention right off, off the gate, then I think you would actually be okay. It would pull it off, but um, a little bit of attention in the beginning would be good. Oh, and Here's that thread leaf one. This one is um, Moonbeam. It's a soft lemon yellow. This one will spread. The tick seed is gonna kind of stay in its own clump, whereas this thread leaf is going to wander and take up some space. Likes the sun. Um, probably 12 to 15 inches tall. And the butterflies really like this. And the bees. I, I have to say that the butterflies and bees pretty much go hand in hand. Um, where, where you see one, oftentimes you're going to see the other because they're both going for the same source of food. <clears throat> Centranthus or Jupiter's beard, this is probably something that you haven't heard of very often or if ever before, but I grew this. Um, I might actually should have put it in the annual column. This is a perennial. It is sold as a perennial, but um, it didn't come back for me very lively. I pl planted five plants and I think I only got two back, but this bloomed like an annual. So if you, you know, you bought them in the junior pots, which is what Wojo's usually sells, who I love, I gotta support my local people. Um, you can get your money's worth out of that plant all summer long. Um, deadheading, always recommend because you're gonna get more blooms that one when you take the old ones off. But this one, it, it kind of, it shows that it's upright. Mine, I let it kind of crawl on the ground. That could be why I got so many blooms. Snip them and they kept coming back. Um, I would also try to maybe mulch them with some leaves or 
bark or straw or something to maybe give them a better chance of coming back the next year. But just from my experience, and I only tried it for one year, um, it was marginal for coming back. But the, um, the bees and the butterflies loved it. Um, if you let it go floppy, it's probably going to be 15 to 20 inches tall. If not, it's gonna be more like a 30, 36 inch tall plant. So it's really gotta work to get a tight back when it falls over. I don't notice much of a smell, but um, it does come in a white variety in this pink and um, the, the butterflies love it. <coughs> uh, full sun, not sure if I said that. <laughs> Simisifuga or snake root. This one is a neat plant. I put a, a nice close up picture there because you get those tall stem, uh, stem flower stems and you can't really see them unless you put them on a, you know, a darker wall and you wanna have some companion plants that are light in color. Um, this is a, a shady type of plant so it would be good to use your coral bells um, because they come in peach colors, lime colors, um, I would not pair this with another purple just because you have the purple leaves with it. Something for them to contrast against and then you can really see the two of them jumping out in your garden. But it's a bunch of cluster of small flowers along that stem and the butterflies just love to hang out there. Shade. I don't think I've given you much shade yet. This is one for your shade garden. Put some dappled sun in there. It doesn't like deep shade, but we always try to find something to go in those shade gardens that aren't just hosta. And the deer aren't gonna eat this. <clears throat> I should have mentioned that all along too. Daisies, you've got that ray flower again, so the, um, the butterflies love it. They can get in there nice and easy. Um, bunch of varieties. You can buy something here that goes from 10 inches tall to 36 plus inches tall. Um, I like the snow cap. It's small, you can put it toward the front of the bed. And then there is Becky, who is nice and tall, real thick and thick for a daisy stem, so they don't fall over with the wind or the rain. Um, and then there's a new variety, Proven Winners put out, and I don't, I don't have any affiliation with anyone. They just happen to be a Proven Winners, but they um, are, that one's called Daisy May, and you can cut that one back, and you'll get more than one set of blooms for the year for your daisies. Because usually these will bloom 4th of July. They are gonna look peak, beautiful, in the full sun. And then three to four weeks later, you're kind of done with them. And you're like, well, they took up such a big space. Now what am I gonna do? That's where Daisy May comes in. She's not as tall, but she is a rebloomer. Full sun, 4th of July. 4th of July is just peak. <clears throat> Echinacea, I can't even tell you how many varieties there are out there now. They're always coming out with some. Um, they started out being a prairie plant. They can handle it um, dry and hot, one of our natives. And they've come to have um, some sterile varieties. So they're a little bit, they give you more of a color um, change where you can get your yellows and your oranges. Um, the purples, they, the birds are gonna love them in the winter time, so you might not necessarily want to cut them down. That'll give them a food source. Plus when the snow hits them, it's real pretty and it gives you something else to look at in the garden when everything is just kind of yucky looking. But the butterflies love this. Lots of um, height varieties, usually starting around two feet and up. Um, the purpurea, which is the original I had along my fence line, it, Fences are four feet tall. It got up to the top of my fence. And um, so I guess right plant, right place. It was really happy there. Um, full sun. I have a, a drip line. I believe in watering the ground, not the plant. But watering the flower petals isn't going to do anything for your plant. You want to water the soil. So I use a drip line and I, I hook that up. Um, I, don't, I do it all myself. I don't have a. Um, an irrigation guy that comes and put it on a timer that I bought from Home Depot and just turn it on. So it, the emitters are every 18 inches and that's enough to, to water your garden. Um, so that you're watering the soil, not the plant. We don't want any of that water to go to evaporation that can lead to insects and disease and mildew and more problems for the garden. But this one doesn't need a lot of that. So it, um, 
it works out all right. <clears throat> I thought this was pretty. It's a nice pairing with the yarrow. You think it's baby's breath, but it's yarrow because these both um, like more of a sandy to a loamy soil. They can they don't need the enrichness of um, all the organic matter that we put in gardens. This can take it um, sandy and rocky and this yucky. Well, you're going to find it out in the fields. You know, it's a native plant. Um, it would also go really good to be paired with that orange milkweed because those you're going to find out in the fields too. Only the milkweed's going to bloom in the spring. This is going to bloom in the summer. And that yarrow, when people have problems with yarrow, it's because your soil is too healthy. It's too healthy isn't the right words. It's too nutritious. It's got a lot of compost and um, that to it so that it, it doesn't like that and it just falls over. So this one doesn't get a lot of that. It's out in the wild and it stands up nice and tall. <clears throat> this is a perfect plant for deer resistance. Regerin or sea holly. This one's white. I've got another one to show you that the deer don't like either, but um, if you've got these little white spiny balls and the bees love them, the butterflies love them. Um, it likes full sun, um, another sandy to loamy soil, and um, it's prickly. You know, you, you, you might want to mark it so that you don't mistake it for a thistle because um, it's, it's spiny and the deer don't like it. We all need that around here. And I thought that that was a really pretty picture. I, I recommend planting things in mass. You get, um, it's, it, it took me a long time to learn this lesson, but when you just put a whole bunch of things that you like in the garden, individually they are great, but when you put them in mass, you really get to see their potential and you get to see them from further away and they really make a statement and I think that this, this did that for it. This is the other one I was talking about that looks like a thistle. Globe thistle, also called Echinops. That, that blue ball has so many tiny little flowers on it and they all go around and sip in the nectar from, from all of those. Um, I recommend wearing gloves with this because it really is spiny. The deer are gonna stay away from it. Um, full sun. I, uh, I have put this in a tomato cage just because, or a peony cage, because I like to keep it looking nice and tall. Um, I think I think this one looks great in mass, but upright, not not a messy falling over like I do some other things. <laughs> but full sun, deer resistant for sure. And we've got it paired with. Um, it looks like foxglove, but it could also be mullein because they both kind of bloom like that at about that time. There's a nice uh, mass picture of it. Eupatorium, this variety is Glenda. This is also called the Joe Pie Weed. Um, I love this plant. This is something for wet soil. So if you have a place that doesn't drain very well, this is the plant for you. Um, it's, I don't think I've seen it in any other color but pink, but this is also going to be something that you're not going to want to move. One, you're probably not going to want to move it because in order to dig it up, you're going to have to put your uh, rain boots on because it's going to be in a moist area. But this clump is, um, it does want, not it, the clump gets bigger, it's not a wandering plant, but it is harder than a dickens to stick a shovel in the middle of. It's very hard to divide. So either keep it in control and just chip away at it every couple of years so that it stays the size that you want, or put it someplace where you're never going to have to go touch it again because the bigger it gets, the harder it's going to be to divide. This gets tall, 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 tall. Um, I would say four to five feet. Um, and I guess I should say it gets tall in my garden. In, in gardens with different soils, your plants are going to act differently. You know, if you get too much sun, it's going to either shoot up or stay small. You know, if it doesn't have exactly what it wants, it may fall over. You know, this one was very happy where I had it, and it got bigger and bigger and taller, just like my um, purple cone flowers. I don't think I see very many that are, are four feet tall, but they were happy and they took off. Would this one do well in shade? No. Full sun. It likes full sun. 
you could, I mean, you could start it off in, in six hours and see what happens, and it'll still grow. Your plant is not gonna die. There's this, what I like to say is it's going to survive, not thrive. So it'll stay there, it'll grow, it probably won't get as big as fast, you might not have as many blooms, and you might have to stake it if it doesn't get enough sun because it's going to be reaching for whatever sun that it can get to. You know, if you've got a tree in the way, it's gonna to try to, or a house, it's gonna to try to bend its way out to get to the sun. So you might wanna stake it in those respects. But give it a try, experiment with your plants. I went to a, a symposium once that they had cactus growing with hosta. And you're like, excuse me? But it worked, you know? So challenge your plants. Give them, give them throw everything at them and see what they do. And you'll have a story to tell your friends. You're never going to believe what's going on in my garden right now. Is, is this one dew resistant? Um, I'm not sure. I'm not sure. I, um, I don't have this in too many gardens because I planted it in mine. And when I found out how hard it was to divide, I didn't plant it in anybody else's garden. And I don't have deer. So, because I didn't plant it in anybody else's, I don't know. So that one you'll have to experiment on. Pardon me. Yes. Oh, the slide before, sorry to go back, but that globe thistle, you said it was paired with either foxglove or something else. Did you say mullen? Mullen. M U L L I E N or E I N? Okay, thank you. Yep. This plant you're not going to see very much of. I've, um, I've seen it at Wojo's, I've seen it at Telly's, but I haven't seen it um, too many other places. But it, this is a very, very neat plant. And it's gonna be something that I don't think any of your friends are gonna have. So when you're walking through the garden, they're gonna go, oh my goodness, what's that? And then you're gonna go, hey, I've got Gio. And, um, and then you can start telling them about it. And it goes a little like this. It likes um, part sun to full sun. So you, you can get away with your um, four to six hours. I, I wander around in the garden um, <coughs> I, it sounds ridiculous to say that I come and work in my garden when I get home after gardening all day, but this one needs, I keep it deadheaded, and this will bloom. Your perennials usually only bloom like four weeks, and then you're done. And I've gotten like six to eight weeks out of this plant just by keeping the dead flowers off. Now, it doesn't come up one flower in one stalk. It has one stalk and a bunch of little flowers. So I'm, not, I'm just going out there with my fingernails and I'm pinching off the dead ones and it's gonna push up new ones right in that same spot. You're gonna get a lot of bang for your buck with this plant. Um, I do keep it mulched because I have lost it one year. I don't remember if it was a hard year or not, but um, it, it stays put, it's reliable. Um, it comes in red, peach, and yellow and part sun, part shade. Butterflies, and this is a little moth that's enjoying it. Is that more like ground cover, or what is? Um, no, it's going to be in a tidy clump, and the clump will grow, but it's not a fast grower at all. It kind of, kind of stays in the same size that you bought it for a while. But you're going to get a lot of stalks. That's where you're going to see your growth is in your flower stalks. It's kind of got a, a neat uh, ruffly leaf too that you don't see very often. <clears throat> Gora, this one is beautiful. Um, it comes in a pink, a hot pink, and a white. It can get about four feet tall. Uh, the variety I like the best is called Whirling Butterflies. Uh, it's uh, this white one here, in fact. And the butterflies just hang on there and they kind of dance with it. And um, it really is a profuse bloomer. Definitely want to um, protect that in the wintertime, protect that crown because it's not a reliable returner, but mine came back two years in a row, so I'm thinking that's a bonus already. Um, and that gets about three feet tall. <clears throat> Helianthus, also known as false sunflower. I have this in my garden, love it. Um, the butterflies, the bees, all hanging around this. and. Um, it can, they've got a bunch of new varieties out there. It can get um, 24 to 48 inches tall. And um, you're gonna wanna keep on it. It, it. It's kind of a maintenance hog, but it's kind of worth it. You gotta stay out there and um, clip those dead flowers off because I ended up finding them in my garden all over the place. <laughs> and, um, 
And I put up with that because of the show that it puts on. I mean, the plant, I, I couldn't put my arms around the plant. It was that big and it wasn't that old. And so I took some of those babies and I, I moved it over to another spot because when you keep your plants deadheaded, you get a longer bloom season. So instead of just a measly four weeks, I'm getting six to eight weeks out of my perennial, which is like unheard of. So it's nice to extend that, that growing season. You're really getting your bang out of that plant. The butterflies just love to sit on it and, and dance around with the wind and sip up that nectar. It's full sun. <clears throat> Lavender. The bees love this just as much as the butterflies. They really do. Um, this is not a native plant, but you might as well throw it out there in the field. It doesn't get any um, water. It doesn't need it. It doesn't require it. Um, it likes it hot, it likes it dry. You can plant it by the rocks. It just thrives on that heat. Um, there's a bunch of varieties out there now, and by bunch, I, I mean like six. Um, but the most recent one is phenomenal, and I didn't believe it, so I had to plant it. They say it gets three feet tall, and it does. And, um, and it's, I wouldn't say that I would use it for a cutting flower, but you can snip those flowers, put them in a little sachet, um, dry a bundle, they, they smell wonderful. We all know what lavender smells like and all the wonderful benefits that it has. This plant, you just put it in, water it for probably the first month, maybe two that you have it in, and then you can forget about it. I had it um, out by my uh, mailbox post and it could handle the salt. The deer don't like it because deer don't like smelly things or prickly things. Um, so that saves your basil and your um, other herbs that have a strong scent. The deer aren't going to eat those. They don't eat this. And um, it just it keeps kicking. It's a really tough plant. You cannot divide this plant. It, it's got a woody stem, so it's not like you can stick a shovel in the middle of it and, and spread it around. But it will um, drop some seeds. And I don't notice that it's a problem, but you might see little babies around from here and there. Full sun, hot, dry sun. And how long will that bloom for? Four weeks, around 4th of July. That's when it's peaked. <clears throat> what variety did you like? Um, I tried the, the Phenomenal. That's the three foot tall one. Yeah, and it, it did, it got tall. The other ones, there's a um, Munstead is real nice. It, it's an old fashioned one, but it does the trick for me. Yeah. Um, Blazing Star, this one you can seriously see all the butterflies hanging out on this. It um, blooms mid to late summer, so you still see a little bit of it in August. Um, this blooms from the top down. Some flowers bloom from the bottom up. This one blooms from the top down. So you're really going to want to, if you're going to take it in and use it for a cut flower, which is beautiful for, you're going to want to catch it early because once it starts to to work on getting those blooms on the bottom sides of the flowers, um, you're gonna look a little yucky at the top, so keep that in mind. Full sun, and this can take all kinds of soil. It's a real, it's a tough plant. <clears throat> There's, that is true, you can see that. How tall are they? 36 inches tall. Now, I have gotten really gabby and um, we have a lot to go, so you are more than welcome. It's it's 22, and we're still in first out of four, so I apologize. I can speed up, or you can hang out and we can keep talking. Um, this is Ligularia. It is something that is for your shade garden and for the wet part of your shade. Sometimes we have dry shade, sometimes we have wet. This one likes it wet, and if it's not wet, it will let you know it. It gets very droopy very fast. There is one that is a spike that's called Dame's Rocket that they, uh, no, it's not Rocket, that they, they like and they hang out on just like that um, Blazing Star. And then this one is that Daisy form. <clears throat> Shady and wet. Bee Balm, they love this. They love it, love it, love it, love it. Um, this plant will wander though. You put it in and it's going to creep all over your garden. It likes it full sun, it can tolerate the sand, but I wouldn't be afraid of this plant because it wanders, because the roots are um, on top and you can just kind of lift them up and 
you, you don't have to dig, just lift a stem and take it back as far as you want and you've already put your plant back into, into check. You told them who's boss. Um, I like to keep this one in the garden blooming as long as I can and not deadhead it because from a distance it looks great. The closer you get up to it and you start losing those petals in the middle, it kind of looks like a, a bald man with shaggy hair. <laughs> but from a distance, this plant looks great. Don't deadhead it. you still got a lot of life left on it. Lots of colors, um, pinks and purples, reds. Um, some of them, well, if you touch this leaf, it smells like Fruit Loops. <laughs> that's, that's how I know where it's at. You can tell where it's gone by just where am I at? I can smell something. Obedient plant. This one's nice for the fall. Uh, I usually see this blooming in um, September into October. I'm doing fall cleanup and this guy is, is still kind of hanging out, blooming. Um, it is called obedient plant because you can pinch the flowers. There's, it's got four sides and if you pinch the flowers to come together, they will stay where you put them. Um, the bees and the butterflies like this, but it gives you some late, late fall color. And they like um, a little bit more, more moist of a soil, and they can take full the parts on. <coughs> Who doesn't know Black Eyed Susan? <laughs> now, um, they have come out with some new varieties of this one too, and I'm not sure if I'm allowed to say this, but I wouldn't buy the gold stir. I guess I can say that. It's my opinion. I wouldn't buy the gold stir. It's um, got a lot of black spot disease um, and it tends to spread and the newer varieties that they come out they have smaller flowers more flowers no disease and um, the brochure says that the deer don't like them but the deer haven't read that brochure <laughs> but, so sometimes they will eat this it does have um, scratchy leaves I do like to put sleeves or gloves on when I'm messing around with this plant just because it makes me itch but I can also wash off the itch, so it's not a big, big itchy problem. Um, but beautiful for our, our late summer fall gardens. <clears throat> Stokesia, this one you don't see a whole lot of, but um, I do recommend it. This is for the um, midsummer blooms. And this, you can see the upright picture, but they really do tend to, to fall over, and you're gonna get more flowers when you let it go but they they do like the nectar in this and the more flowers the better full sun um loamy soil do those come in white at all um i believe so and maybe even a uh, pale lavender but I don't think that they're as strong as the blue one, and it's hard to find a true blue out there, and this one is a really nice, like, periwinkle blue. I have an unnamed flower that kind of looks like that, but oh. it's white. <laughs> okay, well, it could be. Take a picture, you know, and um, you can email it to me or take it into your garden center. They've got a lot of people that know a lot of stuff in there. <laughs> they can help you out, yep. Or if it's blooming, take the flower into them, too. Oh, that's a good idea. Mm -hmm. So this is goldenrod. Um, this is not your allergy plant. A lot of people think that it is. Um, it looks like it, but this plant in the garden is, is more of a, a fall color, but it's not really attributed to your, your allergies that I've heard of. I do not have allergies, like I do not have deer, so I can't say for everyone, but that is what I have heard. The butterflies love it. The bees love it. Um, it's a late season garden, so or flower, so you're gonna have something in your, your fall gardens. And um, a regular loamy soil. <clears throat> it's got stiff stems too, so you don't have to worry about it falling over with the rain or the wind. Um, this is Veronica Castrum, and it gets pretty tall. And you've got these um, spiky flower spikes, I guess we'll just call it that. Um, but they're in a cluster, and it's kind of nice like that. It pairs well with the um, purple cone flower. This is tall. It's more of this white color, and um, I'm going to say tall like in the four-foot range. And it likes full sun, 
and um, low means high. <coughs> and yarrow. I mentioned that um, this likes sandy soil, rocky soil. It doesn't have to be real nutritious. And by nutritious, I mean a lot of compost in there where leaves are breaking down, bark is breaking down. It doesn't need all of that. It just, it's a very simple plant. Lots of colors, um, but if they start to fall over and they're not a tidy plant, then you have too much fertilizer, too much compost, something like that. It's a very simple plant. All right, we've gone on to the annuals. <coughs> Adoratum. Adoratum's been around for a very long time. They've got um, the short variety that's like six inches tall, but they've also got a variety out there that is probably 12 to 15 inches tall, as well as a white variety. And they like to hang out on that. And I will deadhead that just to um, keep the blooms going. And then um, in the beginning, because when you buy them, you just have this one singular little purple flower on top. And as soon as that's done, I pinch it off and you'll get more branching when that happens. So keep in mind, when you pinch a plant, you get more flowers. <clears throat> Alyssum. Not only do the butterflies and the bees love this, but it smells wonderful. You can be walking by this and um, you know wonder where that smell is coming from. It's coming from your alyssum. What I like to do with this plant, this is just my little trick for your insects on your roses. If you plant um, alyssum in mass, it brings in the beneficial wasps and not, not the big guys, these little teeny tiny microscopic um, beneficial insects that will eat the sawfly that is on your roses. Because if anybody has roses, you know that they all get eaten up by these white caterpillar on your leaves, on the bottom sides of your leaves. That's a sawfly. And the alyssum brings in the wasp that will eat that caterpillar. So now you don't need to use insect or disease uh, chemicals to combat your insects and disease. You've got um, beneficial insects that will do that for you. You have to be patient and you have to plant a lot of it so that they get the scent and they get in there. But once they get in there, they do the trick. The same thing with the um, ladybugs and the aphids. When you plant something that the, the insect really likes, they come in droves and then they, they take care of everything for you. And you don't have to go buy things that cost money, may or may not work, have to reapply them, and then they're not good for the, the ecosystem. So. This is nice, we've got uh, the insects taking care of our plants for us. Um, Cosmos, I love Cosmos. They have a two foot variety and a four foot variety. And um, the butterflies love those and they just dance in the wind. It likes full sun, keep it deadheaded. Um, it's got a ferny type of foliage and you'll find those in the spring. You know where you didn't deadhead and where they kind of set seed but they're, they're not hard to, to pluck out of the garden at all. Um, hot pink, light pink, and white. <clears throat> dahlias, um, your, your uh, bedding dahlias, they like those, which are only gonna be like 12 inches tall, and you're gonna need to deadhead, or your taller ones that are like three feet tall that have the, the bigger tubers. Um, the bees and the butterflies like those both. Uh, keep them deadheaded. They like full sun. Yep. <clears throat> Gazanias. This one isn't um, very well known, but if you have a hot, dry area, you can plant this with like your yarrow or your lavender. Um, deadhead it once in a while, but you don't. You water it to get it established, and then leave it alone. It doesn't need anything. And this comes in a, a variety of colors. Usually, you won't find them. You'll find them in a, um, a flat, but not a solid color. Usually it's all mixed colors. <clears throat> Heliotrope, this plant has a wonderful smell. Um, kind of in the, uh, like a sweeter licorice, but not a, not a pungent licorice, just, it's just a sweet one. Um, it's got fuzzy leaves, so the deer are probably gonna leave it alone. And um, it, it'll get to maybe 15, 18 inches tall. I like to use this in the center of a container and it will attract those, that sweet scent. And then if you're dining near your containers, have it on the patio, whatever, you have this nice sweet scent to accompany your guests or your meal. 
Lantana, another plant that you can plant, get it established and leave it alone. Doesn't need deadheading, it just keeps going and going. In Florida, they use these as shrubs. They probably think they're a pest plant, but here we take them out every winter because they're not gonna make it. They've got a lot of bicolors, a lot of solid colors. Um, the butterflies do, do like to hang out on this plant. And it's also got a scratchy leaf that I like to put gloves on with um, because it'll make you itch, but the deer won't eat it. Marigolds, don't be afraid of your marigolds. Um, they've got the, the nice bright yellows now. They've got tall ones that are white. They've got some, I think they're called cherry vanilla now. So they're really branching out away from that, that golden yellow that we tend to, to stay away from in the oranges. But bring them in. They, they bring in your, your insects that are beneficial. They keep the rabbits away. Um, and it gives you a pop of color. Every garden should have yellow in it because it attracts your eye. Penta is another one that probably slipped through the cracks and you don't know much about. But this one um, is a light pink, a dark pink, and a white, I believe. And um, I would use these interchangeably with a geranium just to it, give it that extra um, daintiness, I think. <clears throat> about 12 to 15 inches tall for this one, and you'll find the, the butterflies joining it. Queen Anne's lace. Um, I see these in the wild, and I will pick them and add them to my cut flower, but uh, I don't know if I've ever seen seeds um, available, but you will see the, the butterflies dancing around those, and go ahead and pick them and make a little wildflower bouquet and sunflowers, um, lots and lots of varieties of sunflowers. And we'll leave them hanging around after the butterflies and the bees are all done with them, the birds and the squirrels. Birds and squirrels are gonna be pecking on those for the sunflowers, but it's nice to bring nature into your garden. And um, they will make a mess with all of the husks, but you're not gonna have any sunflowers growing next year because those squirrels are gonna take care of every last drop that falls. Salvia, a um, bunch of different varieties of salvia. You can buy them in packs of um, the flats of 36 or 48, but you can also buy them in individual four inch pots, and that's where they have really branched off and expanded um, with their varieties. And this I would actually add to my hummingbirds. It's probably in there later because it's got um, that trumpet flower and the hummingbirds can get their throat in there. and. Um, really sip on that nectar. <clears throat> Tithonia, this is a nice plant too that's uh, more for the back of the garden. It gets um, three to four feet tall. Sometimes if you've got some great soil or give it a lot of attention, fertilizer, water, you can get it up to six feet tall. I have seen it that way, but I have never gotten it to do that for me. Um, but a nice, a nice orange <coughs> and those butterflies just kind of hang out on that landing pad on top. Full sun. Full sun for the best there. And verbena. This one is not your creeping verbena that you would put in a container. This is verbena boneariensis. And um, this will seed around. Um, and the butterflies love it. It's, it's a, probably a three to four foot tall plant. And it blows in the wind and they're just moving all around. A great for a cut flower, adding a, um, almost like a baby's breath touch to your plant or to your vase. But um, full sun, uh, regular watering. It doesn't like to go dry too much, but great for the butterflies. And zinnia. Zinnia is also a plant that the deer don't like. So feel free to plant that. They will leave it alone. I don't know why it's not scratchy. It's not smelly. It must not taste good. But this, um, they've got varieties that stay one foot tall. They've got varieties that get three foot tall that are great for cutting flowers. And the more you cut, the more flowers you get. Do not be afraid to cut your flowers. Um, and then there is a, a bedding uh, flat that um, Zahara is one of the varieties. Um, and there's another one too. And they come in pinks and yellows and peaches. And you don't have to deadhead those and they like full sun, and they can tolerate it dry. They can also tolerate it wet. I planted on that water stone one year, and um, the sprinklers go on all the time, and they, they manage to just keep on kicking. 
All right, so there's your butterflies. Any any questions for that? Are y'all okay with staying? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Not chatty. So the first one I like is Columbine, and this is gonna be um, blooming here, I would say by the end of May, and lots of colors. Um, there's a blue which is hard to find, it's called Bluebird. Um, lots of um, bi colors. It, this one just dances in the wind too, and that's right about the time, the end of May, when the um, hummingbirds start coming up. So this gives them something to, to fuel up on. Uh, this is more of a part sun, part shade plant. Not a deep shade, it's going to have to have some sort of filtered sun, but um, it's also got a, a nice, uh, a different leaf that's um, kind of like a trifold, just a, three little leaves all put together and they're all ruffly. Um, this does <coughs> get a little insect that will eat between the, leaf, the veins of the plant and it's very microscopic because you've got the top of the plant, you've got the bottom of the plant, and it's growing in between and it's a very thin leaf. But it just makes little tunnels, but it doesn't bother the plant at all. It's not going to stress it, stop it from blooming, stop it from coming back, none of that. It's a very hardy plant. Does it bother other plants around it? Nope. I haven't seen it on. No, it just it takes, it goes to that one and leaves it alone. Yeah. Crocosmia. This is an amazing plant that I don't see a lot of. And in my garden, I had it next to the purple cone flowers, and it probably went four to five feet tall. It was right up there with them at the top of the fence. Um, we have them in Centennial Park um, in the garden that is closest to the ox. They don't get that tall there, but they are this vibrant reddish orangish color that you just don't see a lot of. And these arching stems, just like falling far stars like it says, um, a great plant, just a great plant. It can tolerate it um, hot and dry, moderate moisture, you know, and um, it's a bulb. You dig it up and it's not, it's got its roots, but it starts out as a bulb. And so you'll see little bulblets down there if you were to dig it up and move it. <clears throat> I should have brought some, I got a whole bucket of them. Um, we've got that bee balm again. Um, don't deadhead her till the very last minute. Full, full sun. And the cat mint. They like um, any of those new varieties, old varieties and new. Um, full sun. Bleeding heart. Now that should be bloom, should be blooming by now. A lot of your gardens should already have it in full swing. And um, I don't see a whole lot of hummingbirds up here yet because this spring has been pretty crazy. But if we had one that was in early spring, like the week of Haiti that we had, if it persisted, we would have probably seen them coming on in and getting a drink. Um, this bleeding heart is meant to go in the shade. My mom has it planted in full blasting hot dry sun this thing makes it. It also is supposed to be a short-lived perennial, which means five years, it, it's gonna start declining. Not hers. Um, and it tends to go dormant earlier in the year and start to look yucky around like July, August. And so just cut it back and mark it so that you don't plant something else in its place. Um, once again, not hers. So it just gives you a little idea that every, every bed is different. It really depends what you have going on in your garden of, of how it's going to react. Because if you read the tag, it's gonna say shade, it's gonna say short-lived, um, and it's gonna to wanna to go dormant early. And I haven't found any of those things in a couple of gardens. Foxglove, they love this. They've got that tubular flower that'll go in there. This is a poisonous plant. Do not eat your foxglove. Um, I don't know anybody who does, but you gotta throw that caution out there. Um, this is also something that if you want a lot of, you need to let it go to seed. This is technically a biennial, which means you're gonna grow it. It's gonna be from a seed to a plant in one year. It's gonna bloom the next, and then it's gonna be green and not bloom the third year, and then it's going to be done. So you kind of got really I gave you three seasons there, but it's a biennial, mostly two. So you're gonna to wanna to let those blooms 
go to seed so that you have this cycle of green and bloom and green and bloom over the course of a couple of years and you've got this nice patch all the time. <clears throat> and also you might want to mark it so that when you're out there weeding and you see all million little babies, you're going to not have a heart attack. <laughs> it likes full sun, it'll take part shade, um, and well-drained soil. Coral bells, um, you wouldn't think that um, this tiny little flower is going to get much attention, but I see it. It's not just a picture, I actually see it out there. And um, this is a shade plant. It comes in quite a few varieties, uh, quite a bit of shades of purple, um, the peach, limes, chartreuse. So it's great for the, the shade garden where you've got the, the dense shade and you need those brighter colors to pick it up. Some of them have um, pink flowers, white flowers, and red flowers. And I would not put your coral bells in a very wet location because it tends to get a root weevil. You'll be weeding around and you'll just pluck the whole thing out because they ate your roots. It's a weevil, it's a root, root weevil. Pasta, if you are lucky enough to be able to grow those and the deer leave them alone, the hummingbirds love those as well. <clears throat> Lilies, they can get in there real good. Those like full sun. This is a day lily, but they'll also enjoy your Asiatic lilies. Lobelia, this is another plant that likes the, um, the wet soil. So full sun in a soggy area, they don't mind having their feet wet. And there's a blue variety also, and they get about three feet tall. Is that the um, cardinal flower? Yes. That's <clears throat> your obedient plant they like that as well you've got that tubular flower that's what they're they're attracted to um i they, they do like that red but if you are going to give them artificial feeding do not dye your sugar water they that is very dangerous to them they will die they can enjoy the red flowers that they will be attracted to or the pinks and whites that I have here too, but do not dye your sugar water if you are to give them supplemental feeding. Nephophia is also a hot poker plant. This one, um, is, it's just a real neat plant that likes it hot and dry. Not too many people um, have this. I've tried it. I wasn't dry enough for it and so it didn't hang around very long, but I have seen it in gardens, and um, it, it kind of looks like a yucca that blooms with these um, red to fading to yellow spikes, and um, not nearly as tall, because yuccas can get like six feet tall, and they're not sharp, but the, the structure, the, the mounding habit of them, and the blades of the leaves kind of look like that. Um, it's a real neat plant. <clears throat> um, this one probably gets three feet tall to the top of their bloom, and um, July, August is when it would bloom. Cleone or turtle head, here's another one for your shade garden. Part sun, part shade. I've had it in um, a spot that gets full sun until the evening. So it can take the hot sun, but it's also, I planted it on purpose right on a, a drip hole. So it, when the, it doesn't have to work its way to the water, the water is right there saying thank you. Um, so this one, it speaks for itself. They, they got a little creative with the, the turtle head name. It does kind of pop out of its little shell there. And um, it will start from the bottom and work its way up. So your blooms, you get a lot of, a lot of time for them. Uh, this is going to be a later a later plant, something for the late summer, early fall. <clears throat> and the annuals. Cannas. This is a tropical plant. It's not going to make it through our winters here, but you can dig it up, put it in the, the garage. Um, I would, I haven't tried it. Um, I meant to say basement, I put it in the basement. I haven't tried it in the garage, although I know some people who have. My garage gets too cold, I think. Um, but big clumps 
it's it's total it's a it's an expensive plant it's 10 to 15 dollars for a pot so try to save it and you'll have a bigger healthier plant in the spring when you plant it rather than having to start out with this little one gallon thing all over again so it's it's kind of worth it and um there's some variegated leaves some green some um flowers in red and orange and yellow it's a it's a neat plant it's worthy of having Cleome, this is a big contradiction of a plant in my my book. I love it because it looks great, and it, in mass, you've got all these clouds of purple, um, but it's got thorns, so the deer are gonna stay away from it. It's sticky, so you're gonna have to have gloves when you um, pull it out because of the thorns and because of the stick. Um, but they've come out with some new varieties now, so it's not something that's going to be seeded into your garden forever, because that is something that's very common with this plant. You're gonna have these babies forever and ever, but they've come up with sterile varieties that um, look very much like it. They're shorter. This one is more like a four foot plant. Your sterile varieties are more along the, the two to maybe almost three foot. It's not a very tall plant, but it looks just like it. It's still sticky, it's still thorny, it's just not going to seed all over the place. The butterflies are gonna be more attracted to the dahlia than the, butter, than the uh, hummingbirds, but I have seen them, them on them, but it's not as common. <clears throat> Fuchsia, absolutely. Um, they love this plant. This is a shady plant. Also something that you're gonna to wanna to put in an area that is not very windy. I have bought this, put it in my front porch and it's just too windy and it looks like it needs to be watered. So you water it and it doesn't perk up. And then you lift the pot and you're like, oh my goodness, it's, it's really heavy, it doesn't need any more water. It's wind burned. It, just, it doesn't like all of that, that air movement. So put that in a, in a spot where you can see it but not in a wind tunnel. It is a messy plant. You're gonna have a lot of blooms on the floor, um, the patio or, you know, hanging in a tree so they're falling in the grass. But beautiful and will definitely attract those hummingbirds and it likes the shade. Lantana, you wouldn't think so because those tubular flowers are so tiny, but they get their little beak in there. This is the full sun plant that's, um, likes it hot and dry, the scratchy leaves that the deer leave alone. <clears throat> Nasturtium. Um, this is an edible plant, so you can put this in your salads. It's got a little bit of a peppery taste to it. It's got that round leaf in the back that you can see, which is kind of neat. Not many plants have that look to it. Um, this plant does not like to be fertilized. If you fertilize it, it's going to go the other way. It's not going to get more blooms and um, take off. It's just kind of kind of hang out and not do as well as you would think a plant would do with fertilizer. <clears throat> Nicotiana, this one is beautiful. Um, planted in mass, it's great. You've got the light pink, the dark pink, there's whites, um, reds. It, there's some shorter varieties. Some of them stretch for the sun. There's a white variety that is uh, six feet tall. This plant does like to seed, so it's kind of just something that you have when you get this plant because it's very hard to dead it. And it's sticky. It's kind of like um, a petunia. You're going you're gonna to have sticky fingers when you're done with it. So just go through it and, and wash up or leave it alone, and then you'll have bonus plants for later that season or the next year. Full sun. Petunia. I had to put this picture in there. I've never ever seen a hummingbird do that before. But I thought that, that was cute. Um, fun fact for your hummingbirds, their nest is the size of a golf ball and their, their eggs are the size of a Tic Tac. I would love to see this. So I've only heard it, I've not. And I follow them around to see where they're hanging out and, and they're very good at disguising their their homes because they don't want predators to get in there. But I thought that was an amazing fact. <laughs> Something could be so small. 
This is that salvia that I told you. These are born, or born, um, grown in four and a half inch pots. Um, they will put them in gallon sizes too later in the season because you've got a, a much heftier plant. Um, the tubular flowers are much deeper than the, um, the Victoria blue that you find in flats. This comes in a fuchsia, a couple of different shades of pink. This one's black and blue, uh, a much taller plant also. Uh, this gets three feet tall at least. Uh, full sun, regular watering, regular fertilizer. Um, and it just blows in the wind. It's a real, real neat plant. Something I totally recommend you have in the garden. Um, this is also a salvia, and it's different from the other two. It's, I have seen it sold in flats, but not as often. Um, this is in a red, a white, and a pink, I think. Um, it smells nice. The leaf looks just like your, your salvia leaf, so that's how you can identify it, even though it doesn't have the same flower at all. And um, this will drop seeds too, and you will have that for the next season. But I, I think it's a really nice plant. It, in mass, this is, you're gonna see it from far away. It's great and it doesn't take up a lot of height space. It's a great plant, I recommend that one. <clears throat> Snapdragons. You've got the deep throat in there again, so they're gonna like that. They like the full sun. Um, I tend to, to stake mine. I like the taller varieties and um, use those for cut flowers too, but they do have snapdragons that are the smaller ones too. Keep them deadheaded and your, your blooms will go all summer long and uh, full sun. There's your Mexican sunflower again. <clears throat> and the zinnia. Full sun for both. So here's something I um, I try to stay away from your your pesticides just because they they do the trick. I mean that's what they're meant to do, but they're also harmful. They're harmful to our groundwater if you have a spill. They're harmful to our insects that are just trying to do their job and have a tasty meal, um, benefiting us oftentimes. Um, but there are those, those pesty ones that are out there that we don't like. So try to not use a, a broad sweeping of um, pesticide to just get everything. Because we've got some good ones out there too. You know, if your butterflies, your monarch eggs and larvae are on the underside, your pesticides are going to wipe those guys out too. So you're going to have to be very selective on, on what you choose. I think that there is something for everything but not one for it all. So be very cautious, read your labels. Don't do it in the wind, because then, you know, everything is drifting all on down your garden. Um, <clears throat> and then try to find those beneficial insects so you don't even have to use the expense on here. Of course, there's little places to try to bring them closer to home. Um, that top right picture is at Michigan State. I was in awe when I saw that. And they've got the mason bees in there, and the, um, they, it's just amazing how they can bring all these beneficial insects to your garden and help out our vegetables and um, bring us some enjoyment in the garden and watching things move around rather than just the wind making our flowers dance. Mm. Well, thank you. Um, I do have a gardening business. I, I work in uh, mostly Lake Orion at Oxford with a couple of Metamora. I am hiring if anybody is interested. All ages and ranges, my mom works with us. She's 72 years old. It's great exercise. I've got high school kids, college kids. We learn a lot, fresh air, free exercise. In fact, I will pay you to exercise. <laughs> um, all the tools are provided. Um, if you want to learn more about gardening, come and see me. I'd, I'd love to have you join our crew. Um, I've got uh, some things that I brought up here. Um, my little help wanted sign, if you might know somebody that's interested in working, there's a hot pink sheet. Um, I'm also a member of the Garden Club, along with a couple of familiar faces in here, and we are always looking for fresh faces and new ideas. So that's a little white handout. And I've got some business cards if anybody is interested in a consultation or 
can't take on any new jobs, but I can give you advice on your own personal gardens, and, and maybe we can meet again in the future. Well, and Jill, we want to thank you so it. much for your presentation today.